Shabbat Shalom, Mishpacha, and welcome to Sherut Aliyah, Pastor Norm here. It is the Passover season. We're coming into the spring feast, and I get so excited whenever we come and whenever we roll up on those feasts because they reveal God's redemption in Messiah at his first coming with the spring feast and his second coming in the fall feast. And that's based on Leviticus 23, um, uh, verse 4. These are the appointed times, the Moed. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations or holidays, which you shall proclaim at the times appointed for them. Hallelujah. And um, today is the 10th of Aviv. Um, or Nisan, and and the tenth of Aviv was the day that God commanded Israel to uh, choose the Passover lamb, and then and then tether it and inspect it for four days, and then slay it at twilight on the fourteenth. Well, that first Passover, as we learned last week, and I'm not going to teach on this. You can just go watch it yourself. But that first Passover was, or that first lamb was chosen on a Shabbat, on a Saturday, and I showed you how to do that, uh, and I've shown you that before. And then the Passover was on the 14th um, of, that, of that year, that first Passover, and that it was on a Wednesday. Well, this year, it has fallen exactly like it did the first year. <laughs> How exciting is that? I'm telling you. Um, now, I don't know what's going to happen this year. We'll just have to wait and see. We have it, uh, the Passover is next Wednesday. Um, that is April 5th is Passover. Unleavened bread um, begins on the 6th and runs through the 12th. And right in the middle of that, on April 9th, is first fruits. And then, of course, 50 days later is the um, Feast of Shavuot, or Pentecost. Um, and remember, the first Pentecost was when God gave the commandments at Mount Sinai, and the second um, at Sinai, and the second uh, watershed Pentecost was when he poured out and he gave the baptism of the Holy Spirit on Mount Zion. Hallelujah. And so in this new covenant in Messiah, we have both the law and the Spirit, the Word and the empowering of the Spirit. And that brings us and changes us from glory to glory into the image of Messiah. And if you do not have a, um, <clears throat> uh, a Passover group that you're going to celebrate with and you're going to do it at home, or you want to invite some people over and, and do the Passover, uh, we're going to be airing <clears throat> one of our favorite Passovers that we've done um, on April 5th, the evening of April 5th, uh, beginning at 4 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Now, um, you can watch it anytime you want, okay? But uh, we'll be putting it up at 4 p.m. Now, I just want to say this, is that <clears throat> if you want to follow and read along, um, you can go to our website, and you can get the Passover Haggadah on the front page. Uh, there is a p new uh, Passover Haggadah. You can download it. It's in a PDF. And, and, and just follow right along or <clears throat> download it and do your own Passover uh, with that. Um, I know that it will bless you. Passover always blesses us. It is God's covenant meal that introduces us into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Last week, we talked about, we did part one of the end is the beginning is the end, and that was how Passover opens the door to understanding the last days. And, and we, we used, uh, one of our foundational texts was that we used uh, 1 Corinthians 11 when Paul is talking about when Yeshua um, on the night that he broke bread, he said, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, and this is the bread um, that is broken for you. 
And he said, do it as, uh, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And verse 26, you can see it there. For as all, he said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death <clears throat> until he comes. So, so when we celebrate Passover, we are proclaiming his death on the cross until he comes again. So we're saying we believe that he came the first time as Messiah, rose from the dead, and ascended to heaven. And, th and then according to his promise, he's coming again. So we are celebrating. We are actually prophesying that he's going to return and that we would have certain times and certain seasons that we would know that he would be coming. Um, and the last thing that we talked about last week, and again, you can just go get the full teaching back there, is that um, his first coming, um, he fulfilled, um, I should say his first coming, he fulfilled all those spring feasts, but that was also the betrothal. And his second coming, he will fulfill the fall feast. And that is about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Hallelujah. He betrothes us at Passover, the first, the first feast of the spring feast. And then he marries us at Tabernacles. And Sukkot, when he comes in Tabernacles with us again, which is the last feast of the fall feast. So from the end to the beginning, folks, it's all about him. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> and we talked about how Passover was a time of warning and judgments that separate God's people from the ways of Egypt. And, and that is what it did all through that whole process, the judgments and how he blessed Israel and gave them understanding and, 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 and called them to do certain things and they followed him. I believe that that same thing is going to repeat in the last days because right at the end of the church age, you can see here on the PowerPoint, there's a season or uh, of time, uh, I should say there's a season of end time warnings and judgments that purge, purify, and separate the church from God's final wrath judgments. Um, his final wrath judgment of Mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation. And so, um, so we're talking about Part two now is of the, the end is the beginning is the end. And this, this teaching is Passover, birth pains, and the four horsemen. And we want to start with Passover, beginning with the first Passover, all the way back in Egypt. And I want to talk about the ten plagues so I can show you as we as we declare his coming, or his death until his coming, we remember that he died at Passover, and at Passover, we remember all of those things that took place going all the way back to the first Passover, and if the end is the beginning, then those things are going to happen at the end as well. So let's talk about the book of Revelation in light of the ten plagues, okay, because they're all in there in some form, fashion, or another. So, the ten plagues. Blood, the, the plague of blood, frogs, gnats, flies, livestock, death of the livestock, the boils, <clears throat> hail and fire, and thunder, um, locusts, darkness, and then death of the firstborn. Um, and so the first plague was where God, the water turns to blood. Exodus 7 uh, through four, from 14 through 24 is where that account is listed. I'm going to start reading in verse 17. He says, thus says the Lord. He's speaking to Moses now. Yahweh is speaking to Moses. By this you will know that I am Yahweh. Behold, I will strike the water that <clears throat> is in the Nile and the staff that is in my hand, and it will be uh, turned to blood. The fish that are in the Nile will die, and the Nile will become foul, 
and the Egyptians will find difficulty in, the drink, in drinking the, the water of the Nile. Then the Lord said, this is verse 19 now, <clears throat> Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff, stretch it out over the, water, the waters of Egypt, over the rivers, over the streams, over the pools, and over the reservoirs of water, that they may become blood, and there will be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and vessels of stone. So all the water in Egypt turned to blood. Um, this is reminiscent. Now we see a, a part of this um, uh, in Revelation 8 with the second uh, trumpet angel. Uh, beginning in verse, uh, Revelation 8, beginning in verse 8 says, And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Okay, so we've got this mountain being thrown into the sea. What does that look like? Might look like an asteroid, right? I personally, I think that's what it is. Let's keep going. And the third angel, excuse me, and a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third part of the ships were destroyed. So we've all seen and we've all heard about the asteroids and, and, you know, the report comes on periodically that this asteroid, you know, was as big as the Empire State Building and it just missed the Earth by like, you know, 100,000 miles, hundreds of thousands of miles. Um, but in astronomical terms, that's um, um, astrological terms, I should say, <clears throat> that's pretty close uh, when you consider the vastness of the universe um, and they even made a movie about it they've made a couple of movies about it and um, um, and so we've and, and most of us have seen those types of um, movies and then I want to take us to Revelation 11 I want to talk about the two witnesses for a minute because I'm going to refer back to them periodically as we go through this so that you that you understand what what's going on there with the two witnesses um, and that's uh, Revelation 11, beginning in verse 3. Um, the, the whole account is verses 3 through 13. I'm going to start reading in verse 3. It says this, <clears throat> And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. Now that is three and a half years. <clears throat> Drop down to verse 6. These have the power to shut up the sky so that the rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. Who does that sound like? Doesn't that sound a little bit like Elijah? Yeah. See, there's, a, and whether you believe that it's an individual, these are individuals, or these are anointings that are on the body of Messiah, there's arguments for both. I'm not going to get into that now. Is that this is the Elijah anointing. That ability to shut up the sky so that the rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying, the three and a half years. And they have the power over the waters to turn them into blood. Who's that sound like? Moses. You know, some people speculate that the two witnesses are Elijah and Enoch because Enoch was taken up. And Moses represents the law. And, and Elijah represents the prophet that calls people back to the law. And the law and the prophets testify that Yeshua is Messiah. Hallelujah. That he is God in the flesh, came, died for us, and rose again from the dead, never to die again. And so we must understand, this is a, whether again, whether it's in individuals or whether they're anointings, those two anointings are going to be in the earth at that time. And, and the law and the prophets are going to be preached. And the people that hear that message, like you're hearing it now, and come back to the Lord in and through doing it his way according to the message, guess what? They're going to be protected. Okay? How they do, uh, let's put it this way. They're going to be delivered in that day that we need to be delivered. Hallelujah. 
Boy, I could preach a whole sermon on that. I have a couple times. Some of you have heard it. Some of you haven't. You'll just have to stay tuned if you haven't because I'll get to it later on. Now let's go to the end, Revelation 16. This is the, the bowl of wrath. This is the second bowl of wrath, okay? This is at the very end, just before Messiah uh, returns. He says this, beginning in verse 3. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man. And everything in the sea died. Now remember, in the second in the second trumpet, just a third part of the animals, the, the sea life died, and a third part of the ships were destroyed. Here we see they all destroyed, because this is just before the day of the Lord when he returns. Verse 4, Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. Okay, so there it is happening again, um, to the total uh, aspect of it. Second plague is frogs. God releases frogs on them. That's in Exodus chapter 8, verses 1 through 15. I'm going to start reading in verse 3. And I'm going to go through these quickly so, you can, so that we can get through it and so that you can see kind of how they flow together. Um, take notes. Make sure you watch this again, so on and so forth. If you can download it from YouTube or, or Rumble, Download it, get it on your computer, maybe even copy over to a DVD so you can, um, so you can watch it later on. Verse 3, Exodus 8. The Nile will overflow with frogs. This is the Lord speaking to um, uh, Pharaoh. They'll get into your palace, into your bedroom, and onto your bed and your officials' houses and among, among all your people and even into your ovens and bread pans. Oh, man, my wife would hate that. She cooks bread all the time. The frogs will crawl upon you and your people and all your officials. Now, keep that in mind, all your officials. Hallelujah. There's a, there's a point in all of this. Revelation 16, verses beginning in verse, um, well, it's 13 through 14. I'm going to re start reading in verse 13. Um, and I saw it coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Again, this is, this is the sixth um, bowl of wrath. And I saw it coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. Now, I believe that, 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 that the frogs that came upon all the people and his officials, okay, on Pharaoh and his officials, um, I believe that was a shadow and a type of a spiritual phenomenon at the very, very, very end, just prior to and what's going to announce Messiah's coming, the preparation for the day of Armageddon, the final preparation, the final judgment before the final wrath comes of God. And you'll see that as it unfolds here and as, as we go forward. <coughs> They are spirits of demons. We're, we're in verse 14 now. They are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God Almighty. Now, the key is the next verse. When is this and what happens there? What does Jesus come as on his physical return? Verse 15, very next verse. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gathered them together to a place which in Hebrew is called Armageddon, or Armageddon. We're better known as Armageddon. Now listen, I just want to say this in passing. I've taught on it before. I will teach on it again when I get into the fall feast. But the thief in the night does not come at the beginning of the seven-year period to, to as, as one who steals away and steals the church away. I know we've all been taught that. I cut my, my prophetic teeth on that pre-tribulation uh, rapture theology. 
But hear me, it's very clear in Scripture. The first time I read this, I knew that there was a different understanding. <clears throat> and that was one of the things that, helped, that God helped me to come into understanding the feast as far as events and the sequence of events that take place um, um, it, at his coming, at his return. And so when, when Yeshua comes as the thief in the night, it is he comes at, as the thief in the night at the battle of Armageddon. That's how he comes, as the thief in the night. He's the king of kings and lord of lords, but he's going to come like a thief. And people aren't going to know until that day when they see him. I'm talking about the unsaved now. I'm not talking about us because I do believe in a catching away of the church, what people call a rapture. But it's not, it's not at the beginning of the tribulation. I'll show you where that's at when I teach on the fall feast. It's also going to be in my book. Um, anyway, if you meet the thief in the night, <laughs> it's not going to be a good thing, let me tell you. Anyway, let's keep going, okay? I, I hope you'll receive that from me now. I'm not, I'm not giving you my opinion now. I'm giving you the word of God according to his feast now. Not our feast, not the pagan feast, not the pagan laced feast that Christians ce uh, celebrate, but I'm talking about the feast of the Lord. I'm about to preach myself happy here. Hallelujah. All right. Plague number three. How can we get excited about plagues? Well, that's, all these are signs that Yeshua is coming. When we see these, some of these things take place, we know that Yeshua is coming. Hallelujah. Exodus 8, 16 through 19. Um, this is a plague of life. The Lord says to Aaron, and he says to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth that it may become gnats throughout through all the land of Egypt. Can you imagine that? This is Exodus 8, 16. Verse 17 says, They did so. And Aaron stretched out his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats through all the land of Egypt. Now, the, the, the book of Revelation does not talk about gnats specifically, but this also falls in the purview, uh, within the purview of the two witnesses who can strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire, okay? Um, some people say it might even be, that might even be considered part of the fourth seal. And I'm, I'm teaching on that next week, so I'm not going to go there. Okay. The next one is very similar to that, which was swarms of insects. That's flies, um, and that's Exodus uh, 20, verse 24. They, they come one right after another. Some people say that, well, that was the same one, but if you read between those two lines, verse 19 and verse 20, you'll see they were two separate um, events and they were two separate words used for what was coming, okay? In Exodus uh, 8 through uh, 20 through 24, it talks about swarms. It doesn't actually... In the, in the Hebrew, it doesn't say flies. The word fly is not there. It's been added for clarity what they pretty much, you know, think it probably is. But <clears throat> the word is arab, which is, which is swarms. That's, that's the only word that's used there. And so I'm going to, I've got it up here on the PowerPoint with both words, swarm and flies. But I'm only going to, when I read it, I'm only going to mention swarms because that's what's in the original uh, Hebrew. Verse 20, now the Lord said to Moses, rise early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh. And as he, come, as he comes out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. For if you do not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms on you and on your servants and on your people and into your houses and, and the houses of the Egyptians will be full of swarms and also the ground on which they dwell. But on that day I will set apart the land in the land of Goshen where my people are living so that, the, so that no swarms of flies will be there <clears throat> in order that they may know that I am Yahweh 
I am in the midst of the land, I will put a division between me, between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign will occur. Father, I just pray, Lord God, that you put a division between us and the unrepentant of the world, Lord God. Those who refuse to repent and will not repent, Lord, put a division between us so that it's unmistakable who we belong to. I pray that, asking and believing now in Yeshua's name. I hope you'll receive that from me. I hope that's your prayer because those days are not far down the road. Let's keep going. Again, there's no specific mention of swarms in the book of Revelation. However, again, this does fall within the purview of the two witnesses who have the power to strike the earth with every kind of play and to do it as often as they want. Okay, so so there's there's actually the the very real possibility will come um in that. It's kinda like when uh the scripture says right at the end of um the gospels that um if all the things that Jesus did should not be recorded in all the volumes of all the books. That means he was pretty busy for a long time. Amen? Well, he was there. Okay, the fifth plague. Pestilence on the cattle. Exodus 9, verses 1 through 7. Beginning in verse 1 says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and speak to him. Thus says the Lord, The God of the Hebrews, Let my people go so that you may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them, <clears throat> behold, the hand of the Lord will come with a very severe pestilence on your livestock which are in the field, on the horses, and on the, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the herds, and on the flocks. Verse 4, But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing will die of all that belong to the sons of Israel. And now, there's another curse that comes um, that ends up killing cattle and anything that's in the field. Um, however, um, I believe this is talking about livestock that were, and w the livestock of Israel and also the livestock of Egypt that were both in the same field. I believe the distinction that is there was the Lord was saying, okay, the, the, the Egyptian cattle are gonna die, but the but the Israeli or the, the, the Israelite cattle are not gonna die. They're gonna live right in the midst of that. So as and here's the way that <clears throat> I believe the Lord showed me that that was happening was that when that plague came the, the, the cows that belonged to Israel, the, I should say the livestock that belonged to Israel in the field um, were out there just eating away, not a care in the world and so on and so forth. And the, and the Egyptian livestock were, 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 were dying all around them. And, and so, so we, must, we must understand that, that, that this is where God's grace just protected us. Um, protected them in the midst of all of that. And, and I just pray, Lord, that you have a divine grace, just a mercy and a grace upon us, that you will protect us during certain times, Lord, as these things unfold in the days ahead, that you will keep us safe um, just because you love us, Lord, not even because we're doing anything right, but just because um, um, you love us. <clears throat> Again, those pestilence could be part of the uh, two witnesses, but they could also be part of the fourth seal, Revelation 6, 7 through 8. And I'm not going to teach on this. I just want to mention it because there's four elements of the fourth seal. That's sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beasts of the earth. And so, and that word for wild there is therion, therion beasts. And, and one of the nuances of Therion in the lexicon is little beasts. And so, and so this could very easily, um, um, it, it could be, I'll, I'll talk more about that when I get into the fourth seal next week. 
but pestilence should that should definitely fall within the purview of the four seal and that's happening right now let's go to boils with sores exodus 9 verses 8 through 12 then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take for yourselves handful of soot from the kiln, and let Moses throw it into the sky in the sight of Pharaoh. It will become fine dust over all the land of Egypt, and will become boils breaking out with sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. And so... And so, folks, I just have to say, <laughs> can you imagine just throwing up the dust from the kiln, coming out of a, a big kiln, a fire, a wood-fired kiln, and throw that that soot, that dust up in the air, and 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 it becomes dust throughout the whole land of Egypt, and as it lands on people, it turns into boils. Dear Lord, do we kind of see some things of that taking place in Revelation? Yeah. This is the this is the first bowl of wrath. Um, verse two, Revelation sixteen verse two says, "So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome sore, a, a loathsome, loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast." Yeah. <laughs> Look out! There's more than there's more there's more than just going to hell if you take the mark of the beast. That it, it comes before all of that. Um, malignant swords all over the people who had the mark of the beast. Um, now I drop down to verse ten. It says, "Then the fifth angel, that first one was the first angel. This is the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their their tongue with, in pain." And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains, because of their pains and their sores, and they and they did not repent of you, their deeds. These are those people who will never repent. They cursed God all the way to the grave, knowing that He is God and that he is all-powerful, they will still curse him knowing that they're going to hell. Um, I'm, I just praise the Lord. I don't understand that. And, and that's why we continue to witness as much as we can, as much as possible, okay? Um, because you never know who that is. And, and although I do believe, and I just want this is for somebody out there, I do believe that we need to be discerning on who we're witnessing to. We can never pass up an opportunity to ask the Lord, Lord, do you want me to witness to this person? And if so, how do you want me to do it? Okay? That's coming from the evangelistic side of me, okay? Which, that's the smallest part of me. Mine is prophetic teaching, pastoring, things on that order, all right? That's my primary calling. All right. Verse 7. Or excuse me, <laughs> plague number seven, hail, thunder, and fire. Um, Exodus 9, 18 through 26. So I'm going to start reading in verse 18. Behold, about this time tomorrow, I will send a very heavy hail, such as not been seen in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now, therefore, send, bring your, bring your, bring Israel's livestock and whatever you have in the field to safety, every man and beast that is found in the Egyptian field, I'm, I'm, I'm Egyptian, I'm adding that, that every, every man and beast that is found in the field and is not brought home when the hail comes down on them will die. In other words, the first time um, the, the livestock died because of the plague on the livestock, it didn't make any difference where they were. And they didn't have to be brought in. They just, God just supernaturally protected them and let the livestock of Egypt die. In this case, um, he's telling Moses, you tell even Israel, okay, and everybody, you know, no matter who it was, whether you were Egyptian or whether you weren't, or whether they weren't Egyptian, okay, 
whether they were Israelite or Egyptian, whoever brings their, their cattle in, their livestock in, um, um, if they don't, they'll die. Let's keep going. Verse 20. The one among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord. In other words, see, there, there were those in, among Pharaoh and the people of, of Egypt who they realized that <laughs> Yahweh is the God over all the gods of the Egyptians because the God of Israel, Yahweh, was turning their gods against them to kill them and to curse them as plagues. Yeah, that is an all-powerful God. And there were many in, in Egypt um, of the Egyptian citizenry that recognized that. How many of you know when Israel came out, there was a mixed multitude that came out of Egypt with them and traveled with them to Sinai, got the, got the commandments, became part of Israel, went into the land, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, I believe these, these are part of that mixed multitude, even among the servants, verse 20, even, among, even one among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord made his servants and his livestock flee into the houses. Now these weren't houses in, 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 in Goshen, these were their houses. But he who paid no attention to the word of God left his servants and his livestock in the field. Verse 23, Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire. It rained down to the earth and the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt so that there was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, every severe, very severe, such has not been seen in all the land of Egypt since the nation and since it became a nation. The hail struck, now listen to this, <clears throat> verse 25, the hail struck all that was in the field throughout all the land of Egypt, both man and beast, the hail also struck every plant on the field and shattered every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were, there was no hail. In other words, when God says, bring your, bring your cattle home, yeah, he meant, he meant bring them out of the Egyptian fields and bring them home to Goshen because no hail is going to fall there. Yeah. Wow, I tell you, see now that was, now in that particular case, the first case, it was just by the grace and the mercy of God. He covered us, he covered Israel regardless of, of you know, where the cattle were at. But on this case, if they didn't obey God, man and beast, Israelite man and his beast, if it was in, left in the field in Egypt, guess what? And not brought inside somewhere even in Egypt, guess what? He died, and also his livestock. Yeah. And so we have to understand that there's times where God just covers us. We don't even know he's doing it. He just does it. Praise the Lord for that. But there are also times when he says, okay, you need to obey my commandment. Do my commandment. If you don't, then the curse is going to come. And that's why the curse of the law comes when we break the laws of God. Don't have time to teach on that. Let's keep going. Revelation 11. So let's see where this is at in Revelation 11. <clears throat> the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the Ark of the Covenant appeared in his temple. I want to say that. <laughs> I've got to say this. Um, you know, Israel, the Jewish people, um, um, rabbinic Judaism, is is longing to rebuild the temple. They have uh, they have they have restored all the temple util the utensils of the temple, the the the, the table of showbread and, and the, the the incense and so on and so forth, and they are preparing um, to make sacrifice for because they know the temple is going to be rebuilt, which it is. I mean, there's going to be a temple that's going to be rebuilt, but you must understand that temple. It's not God's temple. That temple will ultimately be controlled and taken over and even authorized by the anti... If it is not the Antichrist himself, 
it will be the spirit of Antichrist that operates in and through globalism or that would be authorized where they'll say, okay, go ahead and build the temple. Now, I don't know how that's going to come about. I have a pretty good idea, but I don't have time to talk about it now. But the bottom line is this, is that there are even messianics that have come back to the Hebraic roots that are saying that they're going to go up to Jerusalem when they start to sacrifice, and they're going to sacrifice with Israel. I just want to tell you because, you know, they're going to, they, and they've got, they, they restored the Ark of the Covenant. They built another Ark of the Covenant. There's only one Ark of the Covenant. And guess what? It's not in Israel. It's in heaven. The scripture right here is very clear about that. And the Ark of His Covenant appeared in His temple. And there were what? Flashes of lightning and sounds and pearls and, and, and peals of thunder and, and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. And the last place we see hail, thunder, and fire is Revelation 16, the seventh bowl. This is, this is the, 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 the end of of all the judgment, says this, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake such as there had never been since man came upon the earth, so great an earthquake that it was, it was was it, and so mighty, and every island fled away, and mountain, and mountains were not found, and hailstones, about a hundred pounds each, came down from heaven upon men, and men blasphemed God because of the plagues of the hail, because its plague was very, was extremely severe. And folks, I just have to tell you, this is this this is clearly in the book of Revelation in a number of places. Again, as often as we observe the feast of Passover, we declare his death until his until he comes again. Let's move through. We got we, we don't have much time left. <coughs> eight. Plague number eight, Locus. Exodus ten, verses one through twenty. I'm gonna start reading in verse four. If you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. They shall cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. They will also eat the rest of what has escaped, that it, <coughs> that what is left, to you from all from the hail, and they will eat every tree which sprouts for you out of the field. And so, in other words, anything that was left from the hail <laughs> from earlier, um, <laughs> the locusts get it. <laughs> Verse six: Then your houses shall be filled, and the houses of your servants, all your servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, something which neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day that they came upon the earth until this day. <clears throat> In other words, the land was filled with locusts. How many of you know that's actually, there's, there's times that that's happening already in Africa. Um, um, you guys remember back in the, in the uh, early, I think it was night, uh, 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 2020, um, swarms of locusts, 37 miles long and, fifth, and 25 miles wide, um, just ravaged through East Africa. Um, it was in the news. I reported on it at that time. Um, and that could also be the swarms, uh, swarms of locusts. Um, and so as of, an, of the earlier plague. And, I mean, check this, I mean, and, and bless their heart, the, the African people are out there and they've got sticks and they're trying to beat the, 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 lo the locusts off. 
Those are just grasshoppers is what they are, okay? There's a picture of them there. You can see here, look at this guy. He can't even breathe. They're all, they're, they were all over everywhere. Don't open your mouth to breathe, folks. <laughs> Keep your mouth closed. Breathe through your nose. There they are on the ground. They're eating everything on the ground, everything on the trees. And you say, well, we live in the city. They won't come to the city. Well, I don't know about that. Look at that. 37 miles long and 25 miles wide in East Africa. In East Africa, those that know the Lord know that this plague has already cycled through one time. And so the fact that it happened, is not, it's nothing new to them. They say, ah, that's old stuff. Revelation 9 and 1. Now this is the fifth angel, the fifth trumpet angel. And there's more to this than what I can teach you right here, but I'm going to read it just so that you've got it in the back of your memory. <clears throat> Verse 1. Then the fifth angel sounded, and, he saw, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to earth, and the key, to, the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went out, Smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given them as, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And so, and so th there's, there's so much more to that. I'll teach on that later. That's a really involved message of what I believe that that is, and, and I will, I'll prove that out to you, um, but I'm not going to just throw it out there right now because that, it'll just confuse people, okay? You guys know me. I like to bring it back to the Word, not my opinion, and that may go against everybody else's opinion, but I like to bring it back to the Word. Here's what the Word says. Here's how you extrapolate that, and here's how you apply that. All right, darkness, number nine. We've only got this one and, and number 10 to go. <laughs> Exodus 10, 21 through 29. We're going to start through uh, verse 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the days of Israel, excuse me, all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. Hallelujah. I believe that God wants us to have the light of the Lord in our houses, in us, that light our that light our, our surroundings and who we're in. I'm not talking necessarily about a physical light. I am talking about the light of the Lord. He says, you are, the, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Amen. Hallelujah. And so we, we have to understand that's what he's called us to be. He's called us to be a light. Praise the Lord. Revelation 16 and verse 10. Keep going. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the, on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened. And they gnawed their tongues and went on about the swords and so on and so forth. Those are the ones that <clears throat> had taken the mark of the beast. i tell you what, folks. Now we come to the, to the, to the finishing, the, the, the finale, the grand finale of all of his judgments. Because, you know, at first, Pharaoh hardened his heart. In fact, there were several times where, where after the plague, um, uh, or in the midst of the plague, he, he, he called Moses and said, okay, all right, all right, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll let you go. Just call off the plague. So Moses calls, lifts the plague, and then he reneged on his, on his word. He didn't let him go when he said he would. And there came a point in time where, where God said, Okay, even if he says he's going he's gonna to let you go, I'm just going to do this thing. I'm going to bring this next plague, and I'm just going to, boom, I'm going to do it. And then he did that for, for two or three, maybe even four of them. 
and 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 it says at that time it wasn't Pharaoh that hardened his heart, it was Yah that hardened Pharaoh's heart. And I just want to say this: there is a time that 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 we come to on this earth where God says, "Okay, that's it, judgment's coming." Everybody that's made their choice has made their choice. And on this side, they're coming with me. On this side, they're not. Sheep are on the right. Goats are on the left. And I'm separating them, and I'm bringing my judgment regardless. Just like he told Jeremiah. You know, he, he sent prophet after prophet after prophet to Israel to tell them to repent before Babylon came to take them. Judah, I'm talking about. And finally, and they didn't, and finally God told Jeremiah, don't even pray for these people. He says, I am going to bring judgment regardless of what they do and what they say. And there comes a point in time in our personal lives as well as the lives of the church, the church as a whole. I'm done. I've warned. I've sent my, I've sent my word. I've sent my prophets. I've sent my teachers. I've sent my pastors. I've sent my evangelists. Those who have heard are going to, are, are going to have returned, and those that are not, are not. I'm done. Boom. And he, and he put down the gauntlet. Yeah. I just have to tell you what, folks, that's coming. And this is, this is where it happened. In, um, um, th this was the final judgment in Egypt. Death of the firstborn. Exodus 11, verse 1. <clears throat> Actually, this is Exodus. Um, yeah, this is, I'm starting in Exodus 11. Verse 4, Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight, I'm going out into the, actually this Exodus 11, 1 through uh, Exodus 12, 32 talks about the whole unroll, unraveling of the firstborn, the Passover lamb and so on and so forth. Moses said, thus, Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight, I am going out into the midst of Egypt. In other words, the Lord is saying, I'm not just going to send these plagues now. I am coming down personally to bring this plague. This is my final wrath judgment, and I'm going to be there personally to distribute it. Verse 5, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of, of the Pharaoh who sat on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the millstones, all the firstborn of the cattle as well. Moreover, there shall be a great cry in all the land of Egypt, such as, such as there has not been before and such has never been and such will never be again. Verse 7. But against any of the sons of Israel, a dog will not even bark, whether against man or beast, that you may understand how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these your servants will come down to me and bow down, bow themselves before me, saying, Go out, you and I, and all the people who follow you, and after that I will, and after that I will go out. And he went out. Moses went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. He was really upset. Now, I'm going to stop there, but I want to recap the plagues of Egypt. I believe they repeat in the last days. Okay, and some of them I think were you know you're probably even seeing. You know, the beginnings of those as we move into the book of Revelation. <clears throat> well, we're already in the book of Revelation. I'll talk more about that uh, next week. And those of you who've been with us for, for a time, you know exactly, you know, what I'm talking about. But let me show you this. Here's the ten plagues on the left. You've got plagues one through nine were like birth pain judgments that were forerunners of God's final wrath judgment, which he brought in person. That was the final wrath judgment. That was the death of the firstborn. Now hear me. Everything that leads up to the physical return of Messiah are birth pain, forerunner, uh, judgments. 
that lead up to his final judgment when he returns. This is the, this is the parallel now. I want you to see that. That leads up to the final judgment when he physically returns at Armageddon and brings that final judgment and he destroys all those that have not followed him, that have not accepted him, that have not turned to him. Does everybody understand? The rapture, the, the church has been taken out at, by that point in time, but on that day when he returns, he takes everybody that have, re have refused to repent, he takes them out. And all those judgments before were like forerunner judgments. They were warnings. Wake up. Wake up. Return to me that I can return to you. Amen. And so <coughs> that leaves us. Here's where we were at. This is where we dropped off last week. Okay that we just went through that season uh, of warnings and judgments that purify and perfect us at the, end of the, at the end of the church age. And we're in that time now. If you haven't figured that out, then I don't know. There's <laughs> I don't know why you're watching us. But the bottom line is, folks, we're in that time now. And we still, but we still have the birth pains, and we still have the four horsemen to discuss. Yeah. See, all of these things are coming together and you can see them manifesting right now and the ones that aren't manifesting you can you can see them that they are definitely coming in the future and so and so we're going to be we're going to be talking about the the um birth pains and we're also going to be talking about the four horsemen um next week and i'm i'm hoping that i'm going to get it all in and so the bottom line is this. And when we come back next week, we're going to start talking about the spirit of anti-Messiah. Because when they came to Yeshua and they said, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? The first thing he said was, see to it that, no, this is Matthew 24, 4. See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will lead and will mislead many. And please hear me, anti-Messiah comes as an alternative Christ, as an alternative Messiah, as a savior of the world, okay? <clears throat> and please hear me, when that happens, even many in the church will follow after him because that will be after a period of time where they say, well, you know, we're just going to do our own thing. We're not going to come back to God. We're not going to walk in his commandments. We're not going to follow his laws and so on and so forth. And he's going to say, okay, that's part of the strong delusion in Second Thessalonians 2. When God says he is going to send a strong delusion on the believing church that have an apostate from him. Go read it yourself. Maybe we'll get into it next week. But that's what's coming, folks. That's why we want to be on the right side <clears throat> of the Lord. And we do that through the Passover um, celebration. Amen? We declare his death, resurrection, and ascension. And by no other name may a man be saved until he comes again and restores and begins to restore the earth, establishes his kingdom, marries his bride, and we restore that we send, spend a thousand years at rest just restoring the earth. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's all the time I have for today. Don't forget your Passover offering. Um, today is going to be one of the last days you'll be able to get it in. Um, you will only be blessed if you, if, you, if, you, if you bring your offering according to, because we can't show up empty-handed, but we, we, we bless the Lord. We give tithes and we give offerings according to how the Lord has blessed us. So if the Lord has blessed you, make sure you get your Passover offering in. And I just want to say this, is that, is that every year as we sow into the kingdom and allow God to sow back into us, our understanding of Scripture only gets greater and greater and greater, not just for the sowing, but for as we walk in His ways. And sowing is just part of it. Hallelujah. You can go to the website or you can go to Ascension Ministries, send it to Ascension Ministries. You can see the address right there. So some of you still send checks and that's fine, no problem. 
Let's pray. I have a scripture verse that I want to pray. It comes out of Deuteronomy 31 and 6, because I know there's a lot of fear out there, and the devil may even try to put fear on you through this message, but I hope that you were encouraged. <clears throat> I know Ken was. <laughs> Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 says this, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Well, Father, we just bless you, Lord. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit that has been encouraging us all through this message. We thank you that you love us. You will not abandon us, but you will keep us until that day that we see you face to face. We do not know what we shall be, but we know this, that when we see you, we will be like you. We love you, Lord. We bless you. Bless our, bless our week, Lord God, as we, as we enter into it tomorrow, Lord God. But give us rest today, spirit, soul, and body, in Yeshua's name. And all God's people said, amen and amen.